Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Benga Bola, and I'll be your host for today. Today's topic is titled Agribusiness in Nigeria and Entrepreneurs Perspective. Ethicals. We are an experienced team of professionals passionate about energy development in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and we are using this platform to support the growth and development of energy and oil and gas industry in Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. We, are, we also want to use foster conversations outside the energy space that support African socioeconomic advancement and development. For today, we will be looking at a Greek business in Nigeria, introduction and overview. And we would be out, uh, speaking to, listening to two different, to three different experts. Um, that will be discussing a quick business finance and investment, as well as have presentations from people who actually practice and whose daily living is a Greek itself. A Greek business, a Greek culture is broadly divided into four sectors in Nigeria, and namely the crop production, fishing, livestock and forestry and based on statistics out there the crop production remains the largest segment and it accounts for about 80 roughly 88 percent of the sector's total output um the sector as well that's the agricultural sector as well remains the largest employer in nigeria employing more than 36 percent of the labor force. And I'm sure we all know that in Nigeria, we rely mostly on imports to meet our food and agricultural product needs, mostly wheat, rice, poultry, fish, and food services. The ag next we'll be talking about the agricultural value chain and I'm just going to define based on literature. A value chain can be defined as a strategic partnership among interdependent businesses that collaborate to progressively create value for the final customer, resulting in a collective competitive advantage. This would further be discussed by one of our panelists and we would also be looking at the typical value chain which consists mainly of primary inputs uh, production and processing as well as transportation and infrastructures uh, looking at the primary inputs we will talk about the farmland would we'll also talk about the food processing and the food packaging under production and processing, as well as storage, shipping, and distribution under transportation and infrastructure. Today, we are privileged to have three special guests. I'll start by uh, mentioning the first person, Ayo Dejiro to me. Ayo is an agric value chain expert and a visionary strategist with emphasis on food marketing and distribution. Ayo has, DJ, Ayo, Ayo has over 12 years experience in the agric business spanning two continents. And he is involved in different aspects of the value chain. The next speaker will be Mr. Bolade Agbola. Mr. Bolade Agbola is currently the MD and Chief Executive of Lam Agro Consult Limited. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria and Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers. He is also the author 
Agricultural Finance, a practical guide for lenders and entrepreneurs. And our final panelist will be Mervis Ayigbe. She is the co-founder and managing partner of ME Solution Limited that focuses on finding gaps in the agricultural sector and creating value through technology. We have the privilege to learn more about the technology they are currently using, which is the soilless farming solution that providing for farmers at the moment. At this point, I would like to call on the first panelist, Mr. Bolade Agbola, who happens to be my uncle, by the way. Uh, so I don't even know Nigerian culture. Is it going to be my uncle or Mr. Bolade? Uh, could you kindly continue or with your presentation, please? Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, put on the video and share my slide. Um, I think you've done a good job in uh, for us to start at. Uh, I will actually speak on investment opportunities in the agricultural value chain. And um, it's my pleasure to be on this program. And I believe that uh, we all uh, have a wonderful time. So um, you spoke in about agricultural value chain, but for us, we define it actually as a set of actors and activities or services and goods that come together to make uh, agricultural products move from farm to the table. And this is depicted by this table, which shows the interrelationship. And the principle is that um, as uh, uh, production moves from input combination to production processing and distribution, values are added along the line. And any investment in any of the value chain, so even those of us who eat the food, we are contributing to the value chain, make stimulates activities in the others. And then we have all the supportive finance, supporting services, and of course, the institutions, the enabling institutions, policies, regulations, and that makes agribusiness uh, a veritable business. Of course, it ramified the entire economy. And of course, I will give a practical uh, demonstration with cassava, which is a major input in the value chain, uh, I mean, which has a very wide value chain. And starting from producers, that is from production to processing and buyers, you can see, appreciate the value chain, that fresh cassava is turned to ethanol to processing. And of course, which is end product for some people, which is input for some people. In fact, ethanol is being used as an additive into, to make biofuel. We also have cassava turned into animal feed to be eaten by ruminants, poultry. I mean, when you talk of ruminants, you talk of large animals like cattle, sheep and goats. And of course, we know the story in Nigeria is, let's put them in the ranches. What they will eat is largely from cassava, and we have it here. We also have flour milling. I mean, cassava turned to flour and used in baking, in brewing. And of course, sorry, it's also used, most of the Indomie we eat. Most of the semovita, you'd be surprised that there is some content of cassava in it. Of course, we also have value creation through starch production, which is used for in our textile industries, which is used in uh, in uh, uh, starch we use in pharmaceuticals, and then we have glucose, which is a major ingredient of most of our beverages, drinks, and uh, so this is the and then the father of it all, cassava turned into fresh food through processing. Gary, somebody told me yesterday that um, Gary's price has quadrupled in the last one month, and I'm trying to get the statistic because there is increasing demand for it. So any part of the value chain is open for us for investment. But we go to the next question. Where do we invest in the value chain? And we, like I said, the value chain is made up of, we've broken those into various components, the inputs, production, storage, processing, and distribution. So just for our knowledge sake, so there are business opportunities for investment in input through the machinery, seed, seedlings. Most of the seeds we are using in Nigeria, they are actually not seeds. So but the farmers are now using seeds which are produced from first generation uh, crops to get enough yield. Then we also have production. Uh, of course, the, the, the before I go into production, 
we can't have sufficient tractor in Nigeria. There is need for it for higher purchase. There is need for fertilizer. There is need for power even on the farm. There is need for feed. So business opportunities. Most of our herbicides and pesticides are imported, so it can be produced in Nigeria. Of course, we have the production livestock, the popular livestock like cattle, sheep, and goats, crop, cocoa, and co. Uh, fruits, and then we have the fisheries, which is everywhere. And then we have it, um, wildlife like snary, which is becoming snary is a delicacy, and a lot of people are producing it. Even people are planting trees as a form of investment in agribusiness. In 10, five years, you won't be, so you'll be surprised when you see a thick tree, it becomes money. Then we have investment opportunities in the storage. We know we don't have sufficient storage facilities. In fact, that's one of the reasons, one of those uh, uh, <clears throat> COVID uh, uh, vaccines that we can't have it in Nigeria because we run the country with an average temperature of about, uh, of about uh, 23, 24, 25, even gets to 40. So bringing it down to minus, it's a big problem. We have the bureaus, we have the processors, and then of course distribution, the processed and non-processed food. When you eat at a restaurant, you are part of the value chain and you are creating job for some people along the line. Then of course, why invest in agriculture? Let's ask ourselves, although these are likely macroeconomic uh, reasons for investing in agriculture but we come to we bring it down to personal benefits the first thing is imperative of national food security we know every nation strives to be able to i mean we saw it during the covid when thailand stopped exporting its rice that is national food security thank god for the efforts we made in producing some rice in nigeria we will have probably starved during the covid pandemic of course employment there's unemployment the figure is unbelievable the only way we can bring it down is to get people to go into agribusiness and create new jobs. Of course, apart from our oil, the other uh, anna of foreign exchange for our imports, the things we don't produce is agriculture. That used to be the norm before independence, but today, but we have to be careful about that as the way in the given the way oil is going globally. And then we need oil as raw materials for our industries, and of course. There is a rising demand for the main three uses of, uh, of agricultural products, that is food, feed, and fuel. And what is driving this demand? We need to know it so that we know why we must be part of people making money in agribusiness. The first one is increasing population. By 2050, Nigerian population will grow to about 398 million. And that means we have about 192 million more people to feed. Then as people's wealth and income increases, through economic growth. The demand for high value foods like vegetable fruits, meats, and dairy products increases. So that creating fresh demand for agricultural products. And we all, I mean, like I said earlier, on, cassava is processed into ethanol to produce, and ethanol is used to produce biofuel. That also put pressure on land use. A small land has to be allocated to cassava. Many people are asking for cassava. Animals need it, we human beings need it. Even our car needs it as a diesel. So, and of course, unfortunately, while these uh, opportunities are happening for demand, the supply is being constrained. Uh, sorry, start my video. Oh, okay, sorry, people are not seeing me. Okay. So, people, so we, we, we have, um, let me go to the last slide. So, we have, uh, the reducing land, arable land due to urbanization, due to desertification. Most of the forest, the fights we have in the Niger and in the country today has to do because of desertification. The lake Chad has increased by a ten. I mean, it is now a tenth of its size in 1960, and then people further for the fire, the elders have to scatter all over the country. 30 percent of northern Nigeria is under semi-war situation with the Boko Haram issue. So those people have to spread out. So, and that is part of the problem we are having today. Of course, there's land degradation, there's pollution, there's climate change, the desert is coming in. And so all these are constricting supply for agricultural commodity and creating investment opportunity. And of course, there's also the challenge that 
most crops are getting to the peak of their increased productivity. You may not get a particular yield beyond. The world moved from a rise that yield about one to two uh, tons per hectare to 10 and there about, but you can't get from 10 to 100. So those are the constraints we are having in terms of even yield. There is decreasing yield, and then there is increasing pressure against use of uh, genetically modified crops. So all these things are creating tremendous opportunity for investment in agribusiness. Now, we also, the last one at that is the fact that there is an imperative for us to diversify because the uh, our per capita oil uh, consumption, according to a writer in 20, 2002, by 2035, if we are growing at the rate we are growing in 2002, our daily consumption of oil per head, per annum, will have been moved to 1.3 barrels to 10 barrels, that's per person. And that means we will be needing about 500, from the 500,000 barrels per day we are needing for domestic consumption, we'll be consuming 8 million, which means Nigeria will even be a net importer of oil, which means that money we are using to import all sorts of things will no longer be there. So we need to diversify. And part of the best way to diversify is to invest in agriculture. And of course, the dynamics have also changed because fossil fuel is actually <laughs> creating problem for demand for petroleum products. Now, what are the features of agribusiness investment? If I want to invest in the area, I need to know what are a few things about it so that it can be a roadmap for me. The first thing is you need to know that there are two modes of investment. You can invest directly in land, livestock, crops, processing, and those are now driven by science and technology. You can talk of mechanization. In those days, when you, uh, you can use your tractor to do multiple things. What 50 people will do, a tractor will do it in a few days. And then you have development of urban farming, greenhouse, hydroponic, soilless farming. I'm so happy somebody is going to talk about that. There's also seed multiplication technology, fertilizer, harvester. These are actually enhancing agriculture and, of course, making it a delight and also fanciful. You have drone technology applied to agriculture today to know where to, how to fight pests, how to apply herbicides and all the rest. And then we also have modern business practices, joint venture, agro scheme, and the contract management, management contract. Then these concepts are coming in to make agribusiness very interesting, very profitable, and scalable. Then the indirect investment in agriculture, which we all know are the usual bonds, equities, and all the rest. Of course, during the recession, we found that the last five years, agri stocks in form of uh, Okomo oil, livestock feeds, Dangote sugar, they are doing extremely well. And we are having about three commodities exchange in Nigeria, which means people can trade in agricultural produce as speculators in the market. Now, what are the features of the returns to agribusiness? We need to know it so that we know the way to invest. Those who want to invest, they must know how does return come into agriculture? Of course, your return depends on the part of the value chain we are practicing. It could be short term, it could be medium term, or it could be long term. Of course, for short term, I will give you a few examples. When you raise broilers in your in the open space in the house, within 35 days, of course, you will have uh, the you have uh, the I mean if you're out of it, you can sell. You can also invest in short duration crops like vegetables, cucumber, lettuce. And then, of course, if you put your investment in procuring and uh, transportation of agricultural produce, they go very short term. But when you are talking of medium term, that is over six months and like one year, you are talking about investing in lay point of lay, uh, just to lay eggs for one year for you, or you grow maize that you have to start preparation probably in January and harvest in July, millet, sorghum. I mean, that is when dry and cutting cassava. Cassava could go a year plus. I mean, 99 months or thereabouts. And then you have long term investment, which may include planting citrus, cocoa, palm oil, cashew. And the beauty of the long term investment is that you have yield coming from them for 30, 45 years. In fact, I have advised people that one of the best strategies for retirement is to invest in tree crops so that by the time you spend four years waiting for the results to start coming in, in, I mean, for another 25, 30 years, you are just harvesting and making your money. 
Then, how do we finance agribusiness? Since we need to do in funding your agribusiness, the first thing you must realize is that agribusiness is a capital intensive business. You need capital to fund every segment of the value chain. And that capital is needed to expand operations or so working capital. And then it's, you also need capital for family living and other personal expenditure while awaiting the, I mean, the, 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 the output from your investment in agriculture. You also need a startup finance because of the cyclical nature of agribusiness, which compares people to pay in advance. You do your land clearing, do your planting, and you have to wait for some time before you sell the products. So for that six months or nine months, you need money. So part of your business plan, you have to provide for that. Of course, we'll stop briefly about that. Then as investor in agribusiness, you need capital to scale up because agribusiness is very scalable. Uh, what the, if you plant one acre of land, the, the skills and tendering and cultural practices is the same thing you will use for five, 10 acres. The only thing is that you may need capital to buy, to get more land or to buy more equipment. The same thing for poultry. The skill you need to raise 1,000 broids, but it's the same you need to raise 10,000. The only thing is that, so the capacity to grow is there in agribusiness, and that is the beauty of it. You start small, can become anything you want to be, growing, reinvesting, and uh, making progress. And then, of course, for you to be successful in funding agribusiness, you need to have good credit culture, because when you need credit, you will always need the credit to, as you scale up. You need to be accountable, have accounts, know what you are doing, know whether you are making profit or not. And if you take money from other people as investors, you must pay your dividend every year, no matter how small it may be. Those are things that is crucial for you to do to maintain the funding pipeline for your agribusiness. And then, of course, let's look at the various categories of this funding. The first one is equity, and the, have, uh, the second one is debt, the third one is grants. And then, of course, alternate finance. In equity, we will still talk about that. That is your own contribution. And then it could be from family, friends, and could be ordinary shares or other. We also have some, the item in pink, uh, uh, well, what we call hybrid finance, like venture capital. Somebody give you money, and then it becomes part of the owner of your business, and at the particular it leaves. We have buy house for distress projects. We have mezzanine debts, which are actually a kind of uh, arrangement that is uh, a debt arrangement for funding that is more expensive, but uh, it's more convenient. And then you have distressed debts that you can, when you have uh, um, those details, when you have a situation where you have to fund by debt, maybe they want to sell the company, you don't have the money and all the rest, and then you now bid up on there. Then we have various form of real debt, that's your private loans, you have higher purchase, leasing, thrifts and credit, cooperatives, and bank, and you have various forms of buy credit. And then, of course, for the young and youth, you can have grants or aids from government, from multilateral institutions, from trust and foundation like Dangote, like uh, uh, all these foundations around here. The one set up by Fuller Faith Foundation. If you have a very good project and you uh, you can actually bring it forward as a young investor and you can get funding. Then you have the, what I call alternate investment, which are creative investments like, I mean, funding, sorry, alternate funding, like agro scheme, crowd finance funding, which you have to be careful. There are a lot of crowdfunding today offering fantastic rates. I think there are things we should look at. And then we have franchising when you, for instance, you can be a franchise for Monsanto in Nigeria to sell those exotic, uh, uh, um those those uh, uh what you call the seeds and, and which is uh, because they are global seed somebody can have a franchise and be selling for their behalf in nigeria so you look at all these things one of the greatest capacities of a startup or any entrepreneur is the ability to source capital from several sources and combine them in proportions that are convenient for him some equity some debt then we also, like I said over there, we've actually mentioned those things that can have your personal resources at the owner and then you have outside investment. Of course, startups are better funded with equity because you need to experiment. In the first two, three years, 
yes, you can have crop failure, you have to monitor, I mean, you can have uh, disease outbreak, you are not used to so many things. So what I generally counsel is that people should use depth in the earlier stages of the project, one, two, three years, land the rope, play experiment with your money, and then thereafter, you can now use borrowed fund to scale up. And you have the four layers of bank in terms of assessing credit, it has implication for funding and interest rates and duration. For instance, Bank of Agriculture for primary production, Bank of Industry, when you are talking of manufacturing and processing, that is the place to go. You know, if you have the equipment to process, they will support you to bring in the equipment and then you raise the working capital from the uh, commercial bank. Of course, there is a Development Bank of Nigeria that came in 2017, which is set up by private sector to do practically what the Bank of Industry is doing. And then you have the plethora of money markets, money deposit banks, formerly commercial banks, which arm do most of the CBA intervention funds, which are at preferential interest rates, say nine, nine single digits. And then we have all the microfinance banks here and there that can give short-term credit. And then we have Nigeria incentive-based risk sharing system, NISA, which was set up to the risk agricultural lending by providing guarantees and other incentives for money deposits, uh, I mean, banks to lend to farmers, especially the SME. They are also doing their own direct farm, uh, lending, but these are all sources of funding. Now, you need to do your financing very well. You need a business plan or a feasibility report that will articulate your operation team and financial plan so that it can serve the purpose of giving you a very objective, critical and emotional look at the viability of the business. What I advise is that when you are doing your business report, do it with your consultant so that you are learning as he's putting you through. And then you can, when you go to the field, it becomes easy. When you have your business plan, it also needs need for managing so that you can blow the business towards success. And it's a means of communicating your ideas to the third parties, your financiers, your investors, people who want to put money in you the bankers, and then, of course, you want to raise money. Even if you want to get government approvals and permits, you need that business plan to help you. And then, what are the benefits from investing in agribusiness? First, the first thing is, uh, those are the micros, actually. The first thing, it gives you consistent and conservative returns, not superlative returns. The returns that is sustainable, that grows from year to year. And it's an edge against inflation. Look at what is happening in Nigeria today. Once inflation is going, price of food is going. So it's a very good edge. And of course, when you invest in land, in, uh, in farming, you gain exposure, and then you also own the land. As you, if the land you bought last 10 years ago, it's not the same thing today. So when you invest in agriculture, you are doing two things. You are gaining farming operations techniques with some additional skills and you are also having the appreciation in value. Of course, investing in other assets like stocks, bonds, and all the rest, they also have their downside risk, especially during recession. And one major thing is agribusiness is scalable. Once you get the process right, you can leverage the business by borrowing or raise equity. And of course, there are risks in agribusiness. We cannot tell you it's all roses and everything is super, this and that. Yes, there is what we call pure risk, which is the probability that you can lose your crop, you can lose your fire, livestock due to failure, uh, weather failure, you can pest infestation, and we've seen low cost in Kenya, ravaging and all the rest. Those things happen once in a while, and there are ways to mitigate them. So we also can have price rates, output and input prices can fluctuate, and then you find it difficult to sell your goods and make income. So, but there are also e risk that can be, uh, most of these risks can be mitigated through good management, sound investment strategy, buying agricultural insurance products and sufficient diversification so because that is critical for you to be successful in agri business, do some elements of diversification. Now I will close by just mentioning a few of the uh, challenges investing in agricultural value chain you can have. The first major one is access to finance. The second one is access to land. The third one is lack of attractive economic incentives. But I can tell you, those incentives are coming now because governments are realizing that you need the agribusiness to be uh, to, to, to be to be able to save the country. So the incentives are coming in. The era of uh, 
government policy changing. I mean, in those days, there would have been ban on importation. There was, uh, I mean, the rice importation would have been lifted, and all the farmers that put money would have lost money. So we are now getting sure of consistent government policies. And then there is also the problem of poor cross-sector cross collaboration. You want to bring in equipment, you have to contend with customs, you have to contend with power. Uh, you don't have all those infrastructural issues in, in place. Then there is also skills. We don't have sufficient manpower in the agri field, but uh, a lot of effort is being made now to actually provide post uh, graduate training for our graduates in agriculture so that they can go into that business. There's government policy and bureaucracy. And there is the one all of us are praying about security. On that note, I say thank you for listening. I hope I've not exceeded my time. So I'm available for questions as, uh, as directed by the anchor. So I can go back. Thank you very much. Um, that was really very comprehensive and uh, we appreciate your time. Um, please note to all attendees, everyone, all our guests, you can please, if you have any questions, can you please type your questions into the chat? We would have plenty of time to entertain all the questions as we go ahead. Thank you once again. Um, I'll call on the next speaker, uh, panelist, that's Deji Rutimi. Deji, please come up. Um, and that reminds me, I've got so many messages coming to me asking me if that's my senior brother. Sorry, he's not my senior brother, <laughs> he's my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, DJ, can you take, can you present your presentation, please? Thank you very much. We can hear you. Okay, so you can't hear me. So apologies, uh, I had everything up and so I'm using two screens, trying to get this back on again uh, to share my screen. Um, it just went dead like two minutes ago, so. But anyway, um, I am Deji Votini and uh, we have been in this agribusiness game for about 10 years. Um, uh, I run Hills Harvest. It's a food distribution company. Uh, we, sorry, I'm going to get the slide up so so you can be able to follow. But I'll, while I'm doing that, I can just you know have the conversation going. So basically, not to make things too uh, complicated, we buy produce from farmers and uh, get it to the market. Uh, in in a nutshell, primarily. Fresh food and uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. So things you can find in your market, in your kitchens, and stuff. Over probably a hundred and something products um, that we deal with. Over the now, sorry, apologies. Zoom now decides to update while I'm about to give my own uh, speech. So if Benga or should I? I can share your. I can share yeah, your. Yeah, you um, so, yeah. So that's good for backup and stuff. So. Yeah, you can share it and just slide accordingly. So, and I'll just keep talking. So, uh, basically, we work from end to end. From farmers, we engage over 150,000 farmers across uh, the the years um, and keep data uh, across Nigeria, and then work from uh, farmer engagements, registering them, put them on a platform, uh, being able to pay them electronically. We have warehouse hubs across the country where they bring their products uh, to um, uh, directly. Uh, from there, we do like processing, you know, arranging them in plastic crates and, and, and making sure things are standardized. And then probably chopping some products, you know, slightly. So maybe in Edo, for example, our pineapples, we have to chop up some dead, um, the tops off so it doesn't have dead weight. Um, uh, amongst things, then, then the logistics arm of things, we remove them to Lagos or the, let me say the market centers. So you have uh, the market centers are Lagos, Lagos Abuja, Abuja, and hold a second, let me mute myself. 
Okay, yeah, I think that's been done. All right, let me stop this video too. All right, cool. Um, all right, so here we are. Are we sharing screen? Yeah, you can share your screen now if your screen is coming up. Okay, fantastic. Let me do that. Apologies, guys. Uh, trying to get this Zoom thing. Um, so as I was saying, we move products straight to uh, um, let's say transitions to SciShow. Uh, move products from our warehouses to the market center, which is Lagos, Abuja, uh, and Lagos, Abuja, and Port Harcourt. Those are the three main hubs. <clears throat> and we get to Lagos, we have a, um, we'll call them distribution centers, where the products come in and we keep, it in, keep them in storage, a facility. Ours is in by the Oregon side, <clears throat> and we have space in Lekki side just to manage the lake, um, the island, and uh, uh, mainland hubs around things. And once our products are in our distribution centers, we all right, we all right. So I can just show you this model from here. Uh, so as I was saying, we have the farmers on here. Uh, from this uh, side with the processors to either the Gary manufacturers and stuff. We only deal with finished products. So we don't deal with the raw materials that, you know, we give to the B2B processors. So we'll deal with the Gary, not the cassava um, or the finished rice, not the grain, you know. And then here in the middle, we have the warehouses, our warehouses, we have the different trucking uh, facilities and Everything is based on contracts. So we engage our farmers with contracts. Mostly it's, high, it's really informal contracts, um, but we, because we've perfected it, that it allows us to pay the farmers 10% premium or whatever the market prices are in their areas. And uh, moving on, then it guarantees this product all the time, the freshest and the best. So as I said, we move the products straight to uh, our distribution centers. Uh, in Lagos, and then move it to the different nodes at the retail level. So we have three arms of our business. Wholesale, wholesale is basically to um, the hotels, schools, the bulk buyers, hotel schools, caterers, and things like that. So if you're having a wedding on Saturday or something, a caterer is there, most likely they bought something from us. Um, then we have the retailers, which are the supermarkets and, and stuff. And we have a unique system where we actually engage the supermarket to outsource their produce section to us. So we run it. Uh, so we do a profit sharing model. So we have our stand there and we have our staff that interact with the customers directly. So things that are unique to that area and that region and the customers want to be able to handle it quickly. So a customer needs maybe cantaloupe or shoot uh, strawberries, we're able to get it to them within a day or two, even from Joss. So, <clears throat> Part of, and also we've done some slight exports to the UK, but we are trying to focus mainly, mainly on our, um, our local uh, market because we have not even saturated that market yet. And our model of transportation that we've you know, built over time is through land. Rail, we did that a bit, but the rails are not very, um, what's the word, uh, stable. They drill three times out of five. So it is not very efficient, but we're hoping that maybe in the next five or six years, we'll be able to get things more efficiently done there. We do by air, so we can get you products all the way from Jigawa to your table, meaning to your table in Lekki, your house, in less than three hours from harvest. We perfected that, and from Joss and Benue and things like that. And also we pioneered moving things by, by, by um, waterways. So from Potakot, all that Niger Delta bunkering route, well, we don't bunker anything, we just move food. So we've been able to use that. So imagine moving from Ondo to Lagos in less than one hour by boat versus a number of hours and you know all the issues on the road. And so, so it allows us to reduce the cost, speed and, of delivery of food and the 
because we deal with perishables, so we have to ensure that things get there on time. Um, and then, yeah, by air and, and things like that. So we've built this over time. And then locally, too, we favor moving products. So if you order from us, uh, we have different brands. Hills Harvest is like the parent company, but Abu's Market is what you see in the supermarkets. So we're in ShopRite, Spa, uh, Jara, you know, a number of food. And uh, um, what is Abu's Market you see? So what we have realized is because of Lagos traffic and things, we don't move things by probably 95% to 5% bikes versus um, uh, trucks. So I prefer to send 10 trucks to one location. That's uh, right, 10 bikes to one location than send a truck with the same amount because obviously distributed systems. I mean, you, I'm sure engineers are here. You understand that if you break things down, you can easily move things around. And you don't have everything at one uh, end point, you know, like a fail safe, so to speak. You have a backup and things like that. So it allows us to be mobile and move things uh, where we need to get them to. And then it's cheaper uh, and faster at the end of the day. It has made our business, you know, we're the only people in Lagos that when you order from us, you will get fresh produce from the market. Literally, as the farmers are bringing it to the market, they also deliver to us. You will get it within three, four hours. Nobody can do that, and we can build our chest any day. Probably people that you might see or you've heard of, they'll take your order today and go to the market and hope to get something. You get to us, we get everything for you. Um, and it's taken 10 years to do this to this point. Uh, these are, you know, we and, and the directors of the business. Um, we are women friendly uh, and, and, and stuff. So, uh, in fact, I should be below, not at the top, because they are your guys. You know, I, I'm the one just doing the work. Um, our span across the country, uh, we've, <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard of the school feeding program. Um, we were the ones that did design from the end to end for the vice president's office. Uh, and that program, well, original intent was supposed to, uh, feed 24 million children for 200 school days in a year. That's massive. It's a $500 million project. And, uh, we made sure that we factored in that it was it's supposed to support 15 million farmers and things like that. We had already done everything, put the structures in place to even get funding for them, using the funding, uh, the, the contract amount as a, as a backup or as a guaranteed fund through CBN. This, we personally had to put our reputation on contract, but as things go in Nigeria, politics entered and we had to, you know, take a step back, you know, and hence why whatever you see there, we don't have any hands in it. We don't, we actually, ensure that we didn't take a penny for anything that we did. But what it did for us is it allows us to see from the national point of what really works, how each community works. Each community, even within a state, within a local government, their cultures and everything are all different. So how you go and buy pineapple from Edo in Edo State to Omwedu or something, there are 10 minutes apart, but it's different because community and everything matters and how you address them matters. So these are some of the farmers that you see here and we have thousands of them that we have that data and, and, and things. We actually have them, we have ATM cards. If I, you know, I will have shown you if I have one here. So these are some of our partners that we've had over the years. We've worked with practically everybody and anybody um, and, and stuff, pick and pay, shop right. We are the exclusive partners for shop right in terms of some products, dispenser, water, and things like that. Pick and pay, we have, you know, pick and pay. Whoever knows that from South Africa, they're like competition with shop right there. Actually, literally launching in about a week um, in Nigeria where they're exclusive. You know, uh, if you need to bring any products to them, you come through us uh, and, and stuff like that. And pretty good guys. Uh, TechnoServe, they, these are uh, development guys and stuff. The government of, of the state, uh, sorry, that's Kaduna. I just I couldn't put everybody here. So you see all that here. Technology-wise, into switch, we were able to get financial inclusion for our farmers through getting them bank ATM cards, but then with pictures. And then we have a database that we can track everything and their spend and everything. So from them even getting loans to paying back and everything else. I don't want to um, go too much into that, but basically an mechanical system uh, and stuff. So we track from end to end, from when farmer gets funded to when they get the seeds and when they produce and deliver to the warehouse and everything else, you know, full traceability. 
Um, so we've done that. This is some of our products. We ensure that our products come up with our best. Um, and so these are cherry tomatoes, these are bell peppers, you know, all probably come from different states. We package them and get them to the store. Uh, you see that we do agribusiness training. This is one we had in all your states. I think we're very parliament hall or something like that. These are farmers that came from all over. Uh, the down place is Edo Farmer Cluster Management that we go to their villages. I mean, this, this, this we've done over the years. Our assets and capabilities. We have the only pack house, automated pack house in Nigeria. Um, that is under our management, that is automated. If I, I, I think the picture might be here, if, if, if so. Cold truck uh, uh, facility, our ecosystem center. Aggregation centers are the ones that are close to the farmers. We have quite a bit of those. Um, so it allows the farmers to just harvest and bring the products to, straight to our uh, farm, uh, our centers without having to go to the market. Because as I said, whatever the farm is, uh, whatever the market is selling, we got guarantee a 10% markup on it to pay them. Um, we have partner farms across the country and stuff for whatever products that is needed. Uh -huh. So this is the distribution automated plant that it washes produce and, 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 and stuff like that. Below that is a distribution center with a cold room in Lagos. These are some of the products that came in and, and, and things like that. So we're always working with time. You know, We have to forecast and plan because we don't have the luxury of keeping rice or beans for six months and things. Whatever needs to come into us needs to get out within that same day or two days max. Um, yeah, truck, uh, this some of the farms. Uh, we did a documentary with some of the greenhouses. So we also support our farmers and stuff to showcase them, you know, with our media partners and things like that. This is the oranges in Benway, that's pumpkin. Uh, so some of our products, uh, you know, meat, chicken, as I said, anything you want, we got you, basically. Um, yes, product list is more exhaustive than this. As we always say, if Hills Harvest can't get it, I don't think anybody else can. Um, yeah, scooping program that we mentioned about, you know, that's where we did that. These are some of the farmer registration that we did. We hired people in the community and, and stuff like that. So things that even the banks can't do, we are able to do. We have more data as far as the, uh, the local communities than anybody else. Um, it's just that we use for our internal uh, bit. We have our site, actually, it's our tech site that has a, 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 um, the ecosystem and, and stuff, you know, that everybody can, well, not everybody can use, but it's for us. So at some point, we might open it up and people can pay us for data and things like that. Um, yeah, okay, fantastic. We have some of the, one of the card here. Uh, this is me about six years ago, I think, or so. The first one on top is me dealing with the farmers in Edu, sorry, that's Oshun State. We're doing a farmer uh, registration exercise uh, and, and so, you know, our platform, we call it CISIS, Central Information uh, System for Informal Sector. Um, this is me talking about the cards and stuff uh, and, and stuff. So we put the farmer's picture there, their data and everything else. So it serves not just as a card, an ATM card, it also serves as an ID for them. <clears throat> These are some of the people who work with DFID uh, projects. <clears throat> And, and, and stuff, of course, there's quite a lot that we've you know, uh, not even gone to. Oh, well, at some point up until before COVID, um, I co-host a, a radio show um, in Lagos, I think on Nigeria Info, you know, talking about agri, uh, everything all about us is agri, talking about business and agri and things like that. So educating people and, and, and things like that. So that's one of the pictures. Um, we do feeding programs for, you know, families and people around and stuff. The other, our trade delegation, you know, we came up as a, we were at a trade delegation to West Africa from US, you know, so that was that. And some of my speaking engagements, I think that was France. I was at the Bull Show, you know, cattle and, you know, all the, all that good stuff. So we don't work up plenty in a, in a nutshell. So that is it for uh, my part. Um, uh, I hope I didn't take too much time, and um, I'm sure the questions will start coming up afterward. All right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Diggy. Thank you so much. Uh, the questions have started coming in for yourself and Uncle, so I guess we're just going to have the questions after Mavis does a uh, presentation. Um, can you unshare? Okay, yes, I can now share the final. 
Okay. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. I'll no, I've this. got. I've got you. Awesome. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here with us. Um, I think you've, you've skipped the slide. Okay, there you go. Okay, so uh, yeah, so my name is Neva Sayedu. Um, I'm the CEO of ME Solutions. Um, I think it's always uh, interesting to kind of talk about how and why one has transitioned um, into agriculture, because I think uh, a lot of people in the business now or who have been in the business for a while, ironically, actually had uh, you know, something else they were doing uh, before they went into agriculture. So my, uh, I had more a career in corporate brand management and marketing. So I, you know, I was managing multinational brands uh, and their marketing campaigns for Nigeria. Um, so uh, I think my transition into agriculture started in uh, 20. 15, 2016, during the oil crisis, when, you know, our economy was uh, severely affected, I felt like, um, you know, promoting multinational brands that are not necessarily manufacturing or producing anything locally or creating, you know, substantial amounts of jobs uh, wasn't really the kind of thing I wanted to align myself with. I felt like, um, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, is making it difficult for our economy to sustain itself, um, you know, from importing too many products and not exporting enough. Um, outside of oil and gas. So um, I basically met a scientist who has been experimenting with soilless farming, and that's uh, kind of how I got into it. I, um, I was very fascinated by the idea um, or the fact really that uh, plants really don't need soil to grow. Um, you know, they actually do extract nutrients and water and oxygen from, from, from the soil. So the soil in itself is actually not necessary, um, not to mention the fact that in the soil, uh, plants actually really have to fight and struggle, you know, throughout their cycle, um, you know, competing with other plants for nutrients and oxygen and water. And then there's obviously a lot of pathogens and bacteria and some of the things that are a bit more difficult to control. So um, soil farming in general, really, I found it very interesting and I really kind of dove into that. Uh, we ended up um, kind of re-engineering um, the aeroponic system, um, which could also be applied to hydroponics, uh, where aeroponics basically means uh, roots are hanging in the air and, um, and they're sprayed or misted with nutrient solutions and water at specific cycles as they require. And normally these kind of systems run on electricity 24 seven because they require a lot of energy and um, I didn't think like that was going to be sustainable in agriculture in Nigeria, you know, having a system, a great farming solution, but something that requires a lot of electricity. So I re-engineered it um, to only run or have a requirement of about an hour of electricity per uh, 24 hour cycle. So, um, yeah, so we basically have been in research and development uh, for the past four years. Um, which obviously takes a little bit longer in a country such as Nigeria because there are not a lot of uh, technical resources that can actually allow you to, you know, go through these processes and engineering processes a lot faster. So uh, it's taken me a lot of time to to do this, um, you know. But thankfully, we're kind of at the end of the stretch, so we're launching our solar farming system um, later this year. Um, so our operational model or our business model is operating as a uh, service provider, so meaning, you know, commercial farmers or people who are interested in diversifying, they want to go into agriculture, you know, they have a little bit of land, but they don't know how to get into it. So we can come install the system, uh, manage the produce for you, manage the crop that we grow in it, uh, and then potentially also uh, distribute the produce. Um, yeah, so... That's kind of our business model on our soilless farming systems, um, which obviously just had a longer runway uh, in terms of development. Um, on the other hand, we also went into social impact uh, commodity trading. Um, the reason why I'm saying it's impact is because, you know, we're not just trading commodities, so we're not just buying and selling cash, but we're actually uh, really working very closely with the farmers. Um, you know, everything from training to providing better pricing, um, just a bit more of a 
transparent pricing model um, rather than just taking the maximum margin possible. So just like Digi said, it's actually a lot more beneficial when you provide premiums uh, to smallholder farmers because for one, it empowers them and two, you will also get a better product, right? So um, we started this with Cashew in 2018. Um, we started very small. I think it was more time to understand the sector. Uh, so we only traded about 38 tons, but then we um, really increased that by our second season where we did, uh, we did a trade of 500 tons. And then last year we did almost a thousand tons. Um, we try as much as possible to buy directly from farmers. The point being that a lot of times, you know, having four, five, six middlemen between the farmer and the final off taker obviously also affects the price that the farmer actually gets because they're, you know, these trades are all adding their own margin. So we're kind of the only uh, middleman, you know, between the farmer and final off taker. So obviously our pricing is much better. Um, we also buy from small level aggregators as well, so not just only from farmers. And then we facilitated multiple trainings on like farming practices, uh, better post harvest practices. So we've done some of that in like uh, collaboration with the Nigerian Commodity Exchange. Uh, we've done it in collaboration with Olam. So we've partnered with quite a few uh, bodies to kind of provide support on the farmer engagement. Um, uh, the cash flow season is actually about to start. So, you know, by next year, we're looking to scale and now expand the locations that we're operating in and also expanding the, uh, you know, the communities we're working with and potentially also the states we're working in, uh, as well as also commodities. So we'd also look at going into cocoa, uh, farm, uh, cocoa trading um, and community impact uh, on that end as well. So, um, uh, yeah, I think um, that's pretty much what we're about, I think I've kind of summarized it, but I think uh, during question on the Q and A, um, people can get more information if they have more questions or they want any more details. Inga. Thank you very much, Mavis. Uh, we've really enjoyed that. Well, uh, kudos to you for bringing such a technology to Nigeria. I guess, I guess okay. we're privileged. We're privileged to have a special one here that decides to go against what <laughs> others are doing, <laughs> planting without soil. I That's know. interesting. I know. I know. <laughs> planting in the air. It's just hanging in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, now we're going to go into the Q and A section. I'll invite all the panelists back on. They are quite a number of questions that uh, we'll be asking everyone. And please, if you still have questions, please use the chat box and um, send, um, type in your questions so we could answer them. We have quite a number of time left to answer everyone's question. Um, uh, the first question I'm gonna ask is from Fred and this is directed at um, Uncle Bolade. Uh, the question says, can one ensure agricultural farming, especially with the issue of AIDS men? Thank you very much. Um, the issue of AIDS men is a hydra headed issue, and um, you can actually, uh, uh, there are different kinds of insurance actually, and uh, crop failure and all the rest. And I think uh, it depends on the way the underwriting is done. Yes, the headsman's problem is a big problem, but it is also insurable. And then uh, I, I know that uh, if you look at uh, so many companies are going to, uh, insurance companies are going to agri-insurance and it covers whether acts of, uh, some of those acts that are not, uh, that are insurable. But I believe that um, most people, the key thing is to ensure that uh, your farm is uh, protected from the endsmen rather than relying on insurance to, to pay people out on it because some of those damages could be substantial, some could not be. I think the problem more of the endsmen are in the killings and uh, the criminal elements of them and then those who go into farms where there are, I mean, uh, where there are communal issues, but I think some elements of it can be insurable, but I, I, I will not be categorical about it. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is for DJ. I think it's just a short one. It says, um, which states are producing the highest volume of produce? Yeah, which states are producing the highest states of produce? Yeah, um, that's what. All right. Produce is very big and large, but I would try to help put that. Fruits and veggies and stuff. So you have between um, uh, the fruits mainly, mainly. You have Benue, um, the exotic fruits and, and stuff. You have Joss. Um, uh, then tomatoes and, and those things you have from Jigawa, Kano, Kaduna, Castina level. That's mostly what they have. But in terms of fruits and veggies, you have Benue side um, and then the exotic um, products you have jobs. Um, yeah, so hope that helps. Yeah, th yeah thanks, DJ. Um, I would I've just go to the next question. Um, this is from Andrew. It says, this is directed at Mr. Agbola, Mr. Bola de Agbola. And it says, uh, what's the direct impact of climate change on Nigerian agricultural sector? And are we, we, are we witnessing? We are experiencing moment? it because unlike in the past when you can predict the rains, you cannot predict when it will start, you cannot predict when it will stop. But massively, the last key farmers are now using aqua weather because there are some greens when you plant them and there is a moisture shock for two, three weeks. You can as well forget it. So, but the, we are feeling it. That's why chart basin has reduced to so one tenth of its uh, size several years, I mean, uh, in 1960. And that's why the pressure on farmers' elders' clashes are getting pronounced. And then, of course, it is also affecting some of our rivers and all the rest, flooding that are destroying so many farms. We have unusual rains and long spell of dryness. That is the way the climate change is affecting us. So, but um, farmers are mitigating this. You see, with a lot of dry season farming, when you have floods, it's also give room for bumper harvest during the dry season. So, what farmers have to do is have to be dynamic in uh, in mitigating the impact of the uh, climate change. But it is reducing area under cultivation, and then propelling us to look more on irrigations. We have a lot of irrigation facilities in the country that we are losing money on, nothing is happening. Government is budgeting and they are not being used for the primary product. Like uh, we have two of the biggest rivers in Africa and several tributaries. So we should be able to dam these rivers and use them for all year round farming. Those are some of the issues we are having in Nigeria in terms of managing our natural resources. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Evis. It's, it's coming from Lacon. Lacon wants to know if farming is lucrative in Nigeria and also how can we improve social inclusion in the Nigerian agricultural sector? I think Deji is smiling, so it, it makes me laugh. <laughs> 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 you know, saying, you know, is farming, it, it's a good question because then the question is also what are Deji and I doing? <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I hope we have a plan. <laughs> you know? um, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's black or white. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of people in the agricultural sector, and I like to believe that none of us is there. Uh, very stupid. I think we're, we're using some brains behind what we're doing. Um, I just think it's important to understand that it's not, you know, oh, you get into agriculture and year two, you're like running on profit. And, you know, it's, it's a complex sector. And then not to mention the fact that when people say agriculture sector, for me, that's actually just a, a, it's just a gigantic, vague term, right? Because you don't even have to be growing crops and you could still be working within the agricultural, you know, field. So uh, in, in, in summary or an assumption, you know, I would say, yes, absolutely. But, you know, um, don't go into agriculture if you're looking to make very quick money, right? You might as well put, you know, money in the bank and, you know, or invest it otherwise. Um, agriculture is requires patient capital, you know, and, and that capital 
can be your time and your life and sacrifice you're making so all that is capital that you're putting in so yes i think it's lucrative yes i think we absolutely have the responsibility to go into agriculture to take our country out of the current situation that it's in to remove the dependency that we have on oil to get us back to the way things were the industry was 60 years ago so I, I, I would say it's difficult, but I'm also not trying to discourage anyone to go into it because I genuinely believe that it's private sector where we're actually going to uplift ourselves from that. It's not government. So we're going to have to do that. So yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. <laughs> yeah. Did you, do you support that? <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. You've muted yourself. So. I mean, do I need to say anything? I mean, she picked for me now. I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there's no quick get uh, rich quick scheme in agribusiness. Mm -hmm. you, gotta, you gotta do the work. You gotta know mm -hmm. your stuff. I mean, we've been here for 10 years and I'm still waiting for mm -hmm. my billion dollars to show. <laughs> but you know what? Speaking on, on to that, just before the next question is asked. Um, okay. Uh, one of my egmos that actually he should even be here, not even me and stuff. That yeah, you I said so, yeah. Him. Oh, yeah, yeah, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mr. Niji Lucas, um, that stuff, he's, he's on. Uh, he's the biggest cassava producer in Africa, not West Africa, Africa, plain and simple. Oh. If Thank you very much. Yeah. That doesn't know his farm or him. It's, it's just not. He's on. He has a restaurant uh, chain. He has uh, a tractor manufacturing line, uh, and also he has the biggest farm. He has a school. He has agri city and stuff. So um, I don't know. Egmont, are you here? Or is there a way that he can talk? Or he can yeah. Just on the what's chat? um? Sorry, sorry, guy. What's his um? What's the name he used to register Kola. so I can just give him access? Kola Adeniji. Kola. Adeniji. All right, I've seen him. So um. You're on now, Kola. You should be able to to join us now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm so experienced. Welcome, Mr. Kola. Thank you so much for joining us. I think he's on mute, right? Yeah, he's on yes, mute. He's on mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, you may unmute yourself now, Kola. You you currently muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear yes. you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. I've listened to the the panelists. They really try. They've just they've done justice to some of the challenges, and uh, I'm happy to be part of this uh, project. And I think uh, we are heading somewhere. I'm into agribusiness. I've been to this for the past almost 30, 35 years. I operate, I operate on end-to-end uh, -end from uh, equipment fabrication, from uh, tractor assembly, from farm mechanization, from processing, then training school. So I was able to put almost everything together. So for people who really want to go so they can actually have a template. Agriculture is good, but you must be passionate about it. Agriculture is good, mm -hmm. but you don't have the knowledge. So you must... You must go for that, make an informed start. Agriculture is good, but you must have the market before you try anything. So uh, th th those are the issues in, uh, in agriculture. So I think uh, for the new people coming to it is good and that's the way to go. But uh, if you are looking for quick money, <laughs> don't come into a Greek. Mm -hmm. If you are looking mm -hmm. for a sustainable, if you are looking for a sustainable way of living that you can live without having any blood pressure, high blood pressure and everything, and you can make an informed start and, and start with what you have in market for. I think uh, that's that's all I would say for now. But I think it's, it's a good one. And we have different programs that we are running for people who want to come, not to give you money, but to show them on how to make money, like the culture. So that's it. And to guarantee you can do something to guarantee market for DG because DG have actually developed the, the demand for his products. Okay. Believe me, I do it yourself. I don't need just <laughs> <laughs> so so that's what I have. That's all I have to say. So 
I think uh, the first uh, speaker spoke well. So uh, for you to borrow the initial money to go into farming, no, don't try it. Just start the way it is and you know where you are going and you can now borrow money to invest in farming since you have red bay packets. So I think uh, that's, that's just it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. you guys can check it in the chat group and stuff. So you can see all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a question from Kubola there. Uh, it says, are you aware of federal state programs that provide land assets, assets for agricultural use? Yes. How can I assess them? Yeah, every state has land that they lease to people. I know Oshun has, Lagos occasionally. These are things that comes up and uh, goes like that. It's also possible in Ogun State, but you know, everything you are doing with uh, federal, I mean, with state governments, you have to channel it through the right, you have to send it through the right channel. But I can tell you that all, all, most all the states in the Federation have programs for leasing land for 25 years, for 30 years to people who wants to do farming, but there are conditionalities attached to it. And um, the, the, you have to know when the offer is available and key to it. So it depends on the state you are looking at that, uh, but there are schemes like that. And um, of course, the further you go away from Lagos, the cheaper the land is. So at times it may be better to even buy so that you are assured, but you can start by leasing. And then, of course, you can then start buying on your own so that land is a very critical asset in farming. You can start by leasing those state lands, and then you can now, but you need to get across to the State Ministry of Agriculture for information on that. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for Mervis. It says, um, I, I hear certain crops require certain level of soil quality temperature and irrigation and all crops cannot be grown in all location with the new innovation of soilless farming is this belief or practice still valid oh yeah i mean i think um the purpose of soilless farming is also for you to actually control the environment a lot more around the the roots right so um and to be honest, I actually think what's even more important is not necessarily the environment around the roots. So temperature, humidity, and all that is actually more affecting the entire plant rather than the root phase. So, um, you know, that's why, for example, tomato farming takes place in drier areas because in the Southwest, tomato farming always comes with fungi issues because of the humidity. And none of that necessarily has a lot to do with the actual environment around the roots, but actually the environment around the plant itself. Um, so for one, I would definitely say soil farming allows you to control the environment a little bit more, but, um, you know, the external environment, you know, whether you're in legal state and it's humid or, you know, you're in Joss and it's more dry, it's more uh, ideal for a specific crop, that still applies. Okay, thank you very much. Did your next question for you, it says, um, do you also have access to large quantity of granules? Well, let me put it this way. Yes and yes. Yes, in the sense that, yes, I can get them from our farmers from anywhere. But now the granules you're asking, are they the ones straight from the farm that have not been processed? Because I'm really interested in processed granules that taste good, not some crap that you made in your house. I don't want that. If I can't buy it, if I don't like it, I'm not doing anything in it. So, um, yeah, we do buy granite. So we do, we have um, products that we brand. So how you have your Tesco and, and stuff that goes to farmers and get, you know, give them contracts to make products for us. So we have our products in Abu's Market of Hills, Harvest, things like that. Yeah. So in terms of access to granite, yes, through our small processors and, and, and things that manufacture for us. But in fact, we actually even help them get the raw materials to their factory and then they onward sell to us. Uh, yeah, so basically, as long as food do, and you can, and is it within West Africa? Yeah, um, we can get it. In fact, okay. funny thing is that we get food from Netherlands too. We import a lot of food from Netherlands, Nigeria. So. Okay, that's, yeah. that's quite interesting. Um, I've got a question from, 
from their being. And the question is, are there programs in place for people who would like to start like basics 101, especially if you have no links to Nigeria? Who's going to answer the question? Mr. Lucas, Mr. Lucas has, he, has a, he has a hotel on his farm. I mean, okay. Like literally, those are the things that um, helps people. So a lot of people that come to me for different things, either cassava and gari and stuff, I'm like, look, I can't, I can teach you, I can talk to you. Go, just nothing else called Mr. Lucas. And he's always as big as he is, as he just now big man, he will always answer your call and you tell you to come down. You're going to chop fresh live chicken when you get there with lafu, with all the effort, all harvested as a this I'm, I'm one day here now. You tell you, you sleep in hotel, hotel level on the farm. You yourself, there's no way. And the thing is, it doesn't, it doesn't need your money. It just wants to encourage you to have a ring fenced framework in your business. So when you put your money in, you have the people that are farming in the local community that will farm it. That's where your money is going to. When they harvest it, it's going to his factory. So everything, in fact, he's only doing you favors by allowing you to just segue your stuff. And then if you now say you want to have land, then you can get land right next to you. You rent your land because he has done all the work already by dealing with the Oshun River Basin and the government and all those things. See me, I've spent 10 years dealing with government. I mean, some people have patience for it, a lot of people don't. And I know my way around them, but you know, it gets to a point where you don't tire. Like, look, I'll just send you to the right people. Like, oh, please help them out. But if those kind of, kind of things you need, Mr. Lucas is the, and I don't vouch for people. And I don't think I can really vouch for anybody else. Because when people tell me that they have um, uh, this consultant or anything like that, I ask you that, what in the consultant don't do? Where in fact did? Because if you never took a hand inside this thing, yeah, how now? You know, I mean, so Mr. Lucas is a uh, point. He does cattle too and everything. Basically, it's the kind of dream that everybody wants. And if you just want to go hang out on the place, fantastic. It's the same. Even, even if, uh, what do you call it, this... Uh, Please, uh, DG, DG, where's the fun? You know, this, this COVID times, you know, that can be like a vacation one can just do, you know? You tell you, you tell you, you can go there. Uh, 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 I'll do COVID holiday. I've been now. Uh, so, yes, please, you guys can go there for tourist stuff. He has everything there. He, you know, he has set up stuff. And he spent a lot of money, but he never asks you for your money. You come and put your hand where you want it yourself, you know. So, yeah, Mr. Lucas, that's why I had to bring him uh, here today. Thank, thank you very good. much. Thank you very much. The next question is for Uncle. Uh, how can we bridge the information slash data gap in the agribusiness industry? Well, I, I believe that, uh, yes, we still have a lot of challenges with information and um, Basic macroeconomic information you can get for the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics and then yield rate and all the rest. I think the best place to also get some of these institutions are some of those stations like IIT. And then, of course, uh, there are a lot of books now that uh, says a lot about, gives a lot of information about production. I know those informations are actually dynamic. I mean, for instance, some years ago, the yield you can talk of 10 tons per metric, uh, 10 tons uh, per hectare yield on cassava, but you are talking of 45, 50 now, and they are talking of different varieties. So, really, for a Greek business, you get your best information from the research stations, and uh, I mean that helps a lot. And um, there are a couple of them all over the country. Uh, Nihot is in Ibadan, IIT is in Ibadan. Um, the uh, research institution for rice is in uh, Pategi. So all over the country, the Rutuba and all the rest in there. Uh, so these people, they have up-to-date information. And when you look at uh, equipment for processing, there are private operators uh, like the DJ. Uh, then, of course, there is the, way, uh, there is the one in Lagos that uh, also fabricates equipment. So I think the information are available, but you have to look for them. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Lighton wants as a question from Mervis. Um, 
which says, have you supported farmers growing perishable produce and improving their quality? Mm, not yet. Um, because we've been in research and development for perishable produce, uh, we've actually not engaged with smallholder farmers yet. Uh, the plan is definitely to be doing that and to actually help with the perishable issues. Um, with smallholder farmers, we've only engaged on commodity, um, on, on agro commodities such as cash for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question for the, for, sorry, uh, for Uncle. It says, what that's coming from Emika. It says, what's the best agricultural companies can, what's the best way agricultural companies can work with financial institutions? Yeah, on mute, please. On mute yourself. Thank you. Yes, the 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 truth of it is that uh, uh, there is a language bankers understand and bring out your business proposal. And I can tell you, uh, the banks now have defined agri-credit departments and uh, you can walk in and then they look at your proposal and then they look at what you have been doing, you see, so that they can be sure of uh, your capacity to do it. And they are actually more liberal on collaterals now than ever before, because that used to be the limitation. So the key thing is to have a business plan. And then from your business plan, then they will know the kind of funding to give to you. But the best way, which uh, is to actually start with your own fund, have records, have accounts, statement of accounts, and then from your records, it makes it easy for banks to support. People accuse banks of not supporting because they are not ready to sit down and put the records there. You can see my farm, you can see this. No, you need to have audited accounts. You need to add track record of performance. And it is, they are all supposed to lift your hand up after you have started the race. That is the role of banks. But if you say you banks come and start from the beginning, then they are taking on deal risk. But there are a lot of novel projects too. All these intervention funds, all these um, anchor borrowing scheme, borrower scheme. In other words, if you want to participate in anchor borrower scheme, which is for small and medium uh, uh, people, you need to group together. So they are now looking beyond your performance at group guarantee, which some of us may not want to do. But as uh, for this class of people that are listening to this program, I think the best thing is let us start something. And then from whatever we start, let's create the farm records, let's do audited accounts, and then we can then approach the bank. This is what we are doing. And they will assist us. Of course, if it is processing where you need big equipment, you must also have a very well documented business plan. For instance, if you want to be processing cashew, I saw somebody who brought in the issue of cashew in one of the questions. Cashew, we all over the world, nations that produce cashew, they have three zones, the West African zone, the East African zone, and then the Indian zone. So um, cashew, you harvest it only for three months. So processing it is a very, very challenging operation because you need to keep your factory running throughout the year. So you need to have working capital that can store cashew for eight to 10 months so that during the period you are not uh, uh, produce, uh, I mean, you are not harvesting, you have something to process. That is what Indian has mastered. Indian use their own cashew. They don't export their cashew. They buy the one from East Africa. When they finish buying the one from East Africa, they come to West Africa to buy our own. So that's why it's a very, very veritable export crop. But we can process here, and about 30% of cashew produced in Nigeria is processed. But it's a capital intensive process. Apart from that, you need a huge working capital to be able to run a cashew plant after putting the plant in place. So those things are possible. And uh, so our banks are willing to fund all those things, but you must get the parameters right. You must get consultants who understand this thing to be able to see you through. And then, of course, you can get the money. BOI is ready to fund uh, processing, and they are doing it, I can assure so I know a few ones that they have done. They are behind the starch processing factory in Ishen. They are behind uh, some, I mean, a lot of processing 
uh, even manufacturing companies in Nigeria. Once you get your concept right, you get your equipment right, and your enthusiasm is seen in you, and your uh, country, I mean, and you are you 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 show every attribute. I'm sure they will support you. Thank you very much. Uh, quite interesting. There was a question from Fred that was directed to DK, which I think you just answered now. And the question was: Cash crops like cashew nuts and others are exported raw to other countries. Why have local manufacturers or governments not invested as much in this? So I think you, you answered that indirectly. Or Dick, do you have any other thing to say to that? I just look, Nigeria get plenty of problem, plenty. And trying to process or do anything locally. I mean, Mr. Bola said it, but there is the part that he probably left off. The people that get funded are people that probably have paid plenty of money collateral and stuff. There's no funding that will happen without collateral, meaning 150% of whatever it is you need. Now, if you have 150% of whatever you need, why go to the bank um, and, and, and things like that? And they don't do asset debentures. You know, everybody comes around with creative things, but you realize that you're better off just bootstrapping and doing what you want to do and you know collaborating with other people to do things than going the path of the banks the banks i can guarantee you in the whole nigeria all the banks combined there are probably less than two people two in the whole banking system that understand agribusiness from end to end um uncle has left the bank so you're not in the bank so you understand what <laughs> Ahead. So this we know. And the thing is, I don't believe even blame the banks in the sense of they don't fund. But what was the opportunity cost of funding agribusiness that I don't know about? And it's patient funding. And we know Nigeria. We do business three months, four months, my money must must enter. Agribusiness, short term in agribusiness, you need minimum of five years. Medium term is 10, 15, long term is 30, 40. And who will go carry money to give that kind of thing? Even the people that get money from agribusiness are people from construction and all the people that have got money. They bring it, they have all the collateral, they collect, collect the cheap funds and take that money and pour it out again. I mean, we know the racket and, and stuff that's going on. And there's nobody that can scale the wise. I've dealt with CB. Wherever they go, reach, I don't did it. And nobody can tell me, I mean, that you can legitimately do the right thing and stuff. Except you want to cut corners and collect the money and no pay back, which is what is happening. I mean, but you have a reputation. A reputation. So, I mean, you should ask Mr. Lucas, has he collected any financing from any bank before? Go and check his website and see everything. He will tell you no. And he would, he's even higher than, he called me this morning and was telling me, you know what, he started of Niger, in the sense that he does manufacturing of tractor in Nigeria. Forget that nobody, you won't hear about this in stock. He does the assembling tractors. He said they jacked up the importation, whatever, from 5% for manufacturing to, to 35%. Now he has to pay an extra 8 million naira per tractor. Baba, even if you're a billionaire yourself, even if you can do all those things, who has the money to buy all those things? There is no credit system that allows you to have all those things in place. And the banks, they look at it that look, I see every time they say uh, Zenith Bank has 25 billion, uh, this person had 100 billion and stuff. Agric is not where their money is going to come from. They don't understand it. it's too long. It, it takes forever, and, and, and the system does not allow for that. And if any money shows up in any form, it will find its way and get that real estate. It's easier for somebody to go and carry money and put into a house in Banana Island. You might not sell it, but that house did you know. It's, Somebody's going to collateralize it. Who is going to collateralize land in agri in agri business? I mean, people will say land and stuff is asset. Asset is only something somebody's willing to pay for. Your land is good for your village and stuff, but if nobody's shelling out money for it and it's not easily uh, sellable to the next person, it's useless asset. Land, ask land doesn't carry significant value in Nigeria. That's just true. So it's a, it's a, it's a dead end. 
it's a dead end. Land in specific areas, Karina. If you have land in Ikeja and yeah. Yeah, you, you, of course, you know. no, no, no. They were talking in the villages that where land one hectare can go for 30,000 naira. So no. what is it supposed to collateralize, really? Let, let, let me shed a little light into some of the things. You see, we got our agri lending right, wrong in Nigeria because of one major factor. We Everybody that ran the CBN had always come from a commercial banks. But the bank that transformed the white people when they were giving, they gave us development finance banks, one for agriculture, one for industry. And then we had the commercial banks. We killed our bank for agriculture. And we created the rural banking scheme and all the rest. We are at what we ought to have developed. This is what Thailand did was to develop a bank of agriculture as a rural bank that is able to lend to sundry farmers. And, and take well, deposits. No, let, me, let me finish. And take deposits from the rural areas. They did that in 1989. And today is the biggest bank in Thailand, supporting rice, knowing uh, the agriculture. But what we need to understand in Nigeria, many of us create the impression that commercial banks ought to do the bulk of agri lending. I can tell you, when I mention commercial banks, I mention intervention funds. Their core business is not to lend for agriculture. I started banking in a commercial bank, lending for agriculture, when they compare a percentage of lending should go to agriculture. Of course, that was cancelled in 1986 with the regulation of banks. So if you really want to process and manufacture, the right place to go is Bank of Agri. And I can tell you they are structured as so many processing, agri processing facilities in the last 10 years that I know are working. I know Sotri in the in the, in the saying. The issue of collateral is a constitutional problem. When we created our land use act, we said that if government takes your land, they can only compensate you for development on it. The development on the land in Lagos or Port Harcourt is the clearing of the trees and all the rest. You probably spend about 200,000 naira to clear it. If government wants to acquire the land, they will say, carry your crop. So until we change that thing, because the real estate of farming is even the real aspect of farming outside Nigeria. So the property has value. It has secondary market. Until we change our constitution, that land use act is the real nemesis of because every land has value. But the moment you say a governor can acquire your land for public interest, and at the end of the day, all they pay you is compensation. My father's farm, when Sonebule ran over it in the early 70s, they said he should go and carry his rice that he planted on it, and they bulldoze it. They didn't give him a penny, a penny. When they were doing uh, 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 Itawu Railroad, they gave him nothing. So, and that is the problem of Land Use Act. And that problem, unless it is solved, you cannot blame the banks. Any bank that has collateral must take a collateral. If you take it outside the urban area, you will not get a buyer for it. So those are structural problems. But Thank you, you very much. Lending, go to Bank of Agri, but the Bank of Agri is non-existent. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one question for Mervis. Um, this is coming from Okwe. Okwe wants to know, can soil less farming improve food production as well as food quality? Or is it simply a more environmental friendly option to traditional soil cultivation? The question is for you, Mervis. Hello? I think, oh, I think we've lost that there. Okay, um, while she get, comes back, let me, there's a question for you, um, Uncle. It says, how can I edge the risk of losing value for cassava farming, especially since you cannot leave produce in the warehouse for more than a few days? Uh, the person had issues with produce being rejected unless they agree to very low prices. You can you unmute yourself, please? Sorry. Can you unmute? Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, that's the problem we have uh, with primary producers who do not have the end to process. Cassava operates like a boom and a bust. If this, like this year now, people are having unusual money on cassava, a lot of people will go into production and then the price will come down. So what we agree is that before you plant anything, you must have an off-taker. An off-taker can be a processor who is processing to starch or who is processing to gary. And then the species you are going to use must tally with that because we are having a lot of specialized people processing uh, uh, cassava to, to, to different products now. So the thing is that when you want to produce your cassava, you must actually have your market in mind. You can also process it to gari yourself or you align with a gari processor. But normally it is the typical problem with so many producers and few processors. So it is the processor that will determine the price. And that is the challenge. But the thing is that you time the harvesting of your cassava and to meet that process. But the key thing is have align with a uh, processor and then if you don't want to do that, have processing facilities and then so that you can add value to it and you won't be at the mercy of the aggregator or the processor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm going to direct the last question to Mavis. I, I don't know if you had the question earlier on. It says, so this is uh, coming from up where it says, can soil less farming improve food production as well as food quality? Or is it simply a more environmental friendly option to traditional soil cultivation? So can it increase food crop and quality? Can can soilless farming improve food production as well as food quality, or is it a more yeah. environmental friendly option? So I think it's uh, it's all of the above. Um, food production, yes, you can you can grow more in a small amount of space. Um, you want to be smart around what uh, pr what crop you use, you know, for soilless farming because everything still needs to economically make sense. Um, so definitely, of course, you can grow more in a smaller amount of space. Uh, and then also the quality, yes, again, um, because, because the plants are struggling less, um, they actually could have more nutrients. Uh, so there's a higher level of flavonoids and, you know, all sorts of nutritional benefits that you get from crops that uh, has been grown uh, in soil farming and in ideal um, environment. Um, so no, it's not just uh, you know more environmentally friendly. Um, there's definitely uh, economical benefits to it. Thank you very much. Um, I said that was the last question, but the one question has come up, and it's from Efe. Uh, this is directed at DG, and it says, "What does it take to build the whole ecosystem, and why did you choose to go down this route instead of fostering cooperation among major?" partners why build the entire ecosystem from ground up well thank you very much uh i'm not a greedy guy and i don't like to carry the world work on my head so yeah um so the journey is this you start from the farm and then you realize that okay yeah you know you've engaged the farmers you've got the products at your warehouse now you need to transport that to, your, to Lagos, for example. Now you stand looking for, because the place is a remote area, you send somebody out on the street to go and look for a bus. You know, at least you should have transport to be very high. You don't need to get a, you know, buy a truck just because you want to move something, right? Because vehicles sitting around. But these guys stand out for almost six hours and don't find a vehicle to actually move stuff. And now we spend buying pineapples and they're all written by the minute. Once that happens once, it happens twice. Next time you're going to bring your truck from Lagos or rent it at a premium to come and get the truck. Then you start to work about economies of scale and hope that as you're doing this, you're able to show somebody else that says, ah, you know what? I have trucks. I can come into this. Does it make economic sense? Do you have the volumes to make sense for me? Um, and then you hope that that person is not doing it for quick money because some days it will pay, some days it won't pay. So it's overall, you have to know that is this a viable business for me? Because now if I'm going to rely on that transportation guy 
And I expect that you always show up when I need him to. And then you decide that, oh, God, I tired to do, man. You know, or I have, I have, I have to move my use. There's a party happening, and I need to help them transport their drinks because they are paying more. And then I'm screwed. I mean, what do you do with your backup? You get to Lagos. <clears throat> well, you need to have your products in a place where it's uh, preserved quality and everything. Because now we're dealing with perishable. Well, if somebody doesn't, because a lot of investment, all those containers and stuff, it's quite a, a bit of investment. If somebody doesn't have it, ideally, I would just prefer to go rent a place to judge it for what I need. But if there's none, I can't keep bringing products, do all the work. Imagine you can do all the work and everything for, 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 for the last one day or a couple of hours, and you get to Lagos, and you don't have any way to preserve it. Because the thing is, you get to Lagos, you're not selling the market. You're selling this thing over the next two or three or four days. But if you don't preserve it, it destroys in the next couple of hours. Now, all that effort has gone to naught. Now, we're talking about two million naira down the toilet. What do you do? You find a way to mitigate that. You get your own spot. And so you get, the, you get the gist. You have to find a way to control it. And unfortunately, that is the weight that we have to carry. So we end up doing almost like 10 or 15 businesses in one, if you even go down to break it down. Do we want to do that? No. In fact, all I really want to do is engage the customers at the end of the day and the supermarkets and yeah. get the best customer service so that we aggregate the demands and can work backwards. But yeah, um, it doesn't exist uh, as it is. And if you find somebody, do they have the tenacity to um, last long? This is a passion-based business plus. It's a long-term revenue store. Nigeria's system is not built for that. In fact, after 10 years, I realized that Nigeria is a transaction-based economy, not a business. You know, so we are here, we're standing, but there's always that quick, fast cash stuff that you can easily do and get 10% of stuff, and you have to sell money. Yes, now, that's, to... that, that brings me to the final question from me. A lot of people have been asking in the sense that, is it advisable to invest in the various farm crowding schemes out there whereby you're told 20,000 minimum investment to get 20% in three months and six months or told to invest in some farm that is making maize for six months and you get 40% return because can that I would classify that as an advanced level of MMM sorry to say but so much, please yeah, because light. I was going to say, I'm not going to comment to that. That's pretty much that was going okay. to be my response. Like, no comment. Can I say something? Okay. I mean, I, I, well, let me, let me just uh, let me just uh, clarify something. You see, all those returns uh, that are not realistic, we must be very careful about them. I've seen so many advertisements. And I've been at Florum where some of them admitted that the first three or four years, they have struggled and they, all they are doing is just keeping to pay and hoping to be able to recover. People must be very careful. That is, uh, you know, the typical Ponzi scheme comes in like that. They promise you fantastic returns, keep the advertisement running, and then use new monies to pay maturing obligations while they are struggling with the business. Anybody who wants to invest in a Ponzi scheme, I believe should ask for five years audited account of that enterprise to see how they have been making money and how they have been distributing it. <laughs> or at you know, <laughs> three years. Because honestly, it is very simple. I promise you 20%, you give me the cash, then I'm paying you. Of course, I keep on advertising. New people say, ah, he's paying. Ah, come on, go in. It's a Ponzi scheme, kind of. That uh, I mean, that's the concept of Ponzi scheme. You know, you use maturing new monies to pay maturing obligation, but there's a deep hole in the enterprise. So, and it's the last set of people to go in that are bonds. So people have to be careful. Agri business does not bring out those returns, and that is the truth. If you want to say you are doing crowdfunding and you are saying give us moratorium of two years, then after two years, we start paying these and reasonable returns, not outrageous returns. Because, I mean, so many things could go wrong. Of course, the moment when it comes to 
to the payment will be going on, new money will be coming in and all the rest. But if you want to guide against it, ask for three years auditor return by a reputable auditor, study the finance very well before you take your investment decision. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists. It's been so much fun having you on this webinar. I hope you all enjoyed yourself. Thank you to all the guests as well, all our attendees. Um, the presentation of the entire webinar will be made available uh, through the email addresses you used to register, as well as this, um, the recording for this webinar. This will be posted on the uh, YouTube channel um, as well. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to share the next, um, our next, web next webinar comes up on the 20th of March, and it is titled Gas in Sub-Sahara Africa, looking at the opportunities, challenges, and limitation would have yet again a set of fantastic panelists discussing the on on the existing gas fields, um, gas to power LPG, and uh, in development gas field as well. It certainly is going to be a very interesting webinar. Once again, I want to thank you all. Thank you, uh, DG. Thank you, uh, my dear uncle, Mr. Boladi Agbola. Thank you, Mavis. Uh, that's turning Nigeria around, the, the special one in Nigeria at the moment. Thank you so much to all everyone that has been around and has partaken in this um, webinar on this beautiful Saturday evening. Hope to see you all on the next webinar. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please, uh, we are available to answer any questions as well. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.